At the height of the Sydney bikey wars of 2009, the young and charming Comanchero president, Mahmood Mick Howie, appeared to have it all. The national leader of one of Australia's most well-known outlaw motorcycle groups, known for embellishing the flashy outlaw lifestyle, had all the trappings of a successful bikey. Wealth, power, a beautiful wife, two children, and a seeming ability to cheat death within the palm of his hand. Mick Howie seemed untouchable. Though, with the volatile nature of Sydney's underworld, it can all be taken away in a matter of moments. This is the life and times of Mick Howie. Howie was born in Beirut, Lebanon, into a Sunni Muslim family. In 1985, his family fled the Lebanon Civil War as refugees and settled in Sydney, Australia. Howie's childhood was described as uneventful, if meagre, by a judge in 2011. At the age of 16, Howie left school to work for his father's spray painting business. However, the 9 to 5 life wasn't for Howie. Like a lot of young men, he seeked a sense of excitement and belonging. It was in 1998 that Howie, aged 18, joined the Comanchero Motorcycle Club. Just quickly, if you're enjoying this video so far, please consider subscribing and liking this video. It really helps me out and helps the channel grow. Howie was described as a man who lived by the bikey code and never snitched. From a young age, Howie had big aspirations and had his eye on the top spot. It's reported that a young Howie rode out to Windsor in northwest Sydney with a few other Comancheros and told Jock Ross, who called himself the commander of the club, that they were retiring him. Just four years after joining the club, Howie became the national president of the Comancheros at 22 and he demanded respect. His lieutenants were Hakan Ayik and Durax Nagakuru, who were major money earners for the club, especially Ayik, who organised massive drug importations and was said to be a genius at money laundering. There were two sides to Howie. One was a hardened and feared outlaw bikey who ordered beatings and bombings of rival clubhouses, while the other was a family man who married his childhood sweetheart Carolina Gonzalez and had two children. As well as living an outlaw bikey life, Howie was also reportedly a successful businessman who took care of his family. In 2007, Howie set up a refrigerated transport company and employed his father. Unlike a lot of others in the underworld, Howie didn't have a history of drug or alcohol abuse and appeared to have led a settled life characterised by his self-employment and involvement with his family. Despite being in charge of a fierce outlaw motorcycle club, Howie managed to keep his hands relatively clean, other than a few driving offences, an offensive language charge and being caught in possession of a prescripted restricted substance in 2005. However, Howie's reputation within the Sydney underworld was growing. It's reported that the club was making huge profits from drug deals and the Comancheros and Mick Howie were making enemies. Though it wasn't until the infamous bikey brawl at Sydney Airport in 2009 that Howie's name became more widely known. In 2007, after a leisurely lunch with members of the Fink bikey gang, Howie's car was sprayed with bullets. He narrowly escaped with his life as he sped off. One of the bullets was found lodged in the headrest, showing just how close Howie came to death that day. Most thought the Hells Angels were behind the shooting, though this was never proved. During this time, tensions were high as it was reported that the Hells Angels were trying to muscle in on Comanchero stronghold, Brightonly Sands. Hells Angels member Peter Zervas had recently been released from jail and decided to open a tattoo parlour called Angels Cosmetic Tattoo in Bay Street, Brightonly Sands. Unsurprisingly, the Comancheros were not impressed. The president of the Sydney chapter of the Hells Angels Derek Wainahu and Mick Howie had organised a sit-down to discuss the problems with Zervas's parlour. An underworld figure told news outlet the Sydney Herald, during the meeting, Anthony Zervas, younger brother of Peter Zervas, arrived with a sawn-off shotgun. A scuffle ensued, during which one of the Comancheros was hit in the head with the gun. The peace talks were over. The next day, the tattoo parlour was sprayed with bullets. Several weeks later, the parlour was firebombed and the building went up in flames. This wouldn't be the last time Mick Howie had a run-in with the Zervas brothers. 2009, the year of the infamous Sydney Airport brawl. 
In March 2009, Howie was on a domestic flight from Melbourne to Sydney alongside four of his fellow Comanchero members when he spotted the unmistakable wings of the Hells Angels on the t-shirt of Derek Wainahu. A witness stated, a member of the Comancheros yelled, you're a dead man walking, as they boarded the plane. Each called for reinforcements to be waiting at Sydney. On the ground, all hell broke loose. A wild brawl erupted in front of terrified travellers and children. During the brawl, Anthony Zervas suffered a fatal head injury along with multiple stab wounds to the chest. The brawl allegedly ended with Howie screaming at Peter Zervas, You're dead. You're effing dead. Next time I see you, you're going to have bullet holes through you. Howie went into hiding after the airport incident and was for a time Australia's most wanted man. Just over a week after Anthony Zervas was killed at Sydney International Airport, his brother Peter was shot multiple times in the car park of his home in Sydney Southwest. After an unknown gunman fired 10 shots into his car, Peter Zervas was rushed to hospital and survived the attack. Shortly after going on the run, Howie decided to hand himself into police. Howie was charged with second degree murder and his trial began on the 25th of May 2011. On the 1st of November 2011, Howie was found guilty of second degree murder and affray and was sentenced to a maximum of 28 years in prison with a non-parole period of 21 years. However, the judge felt that the Crown had not established that Howie had personally inflicted any blows on Zervas, but that his presence would undoubtedly have had the effect of authorising and approving the actions of the man who bludgeoned Anthony Zervas to death. Howie appealed the murder conviction and in a plea bargain with the Crown on the 4th of September 2014 pleaded guilty to manslaughter. Howie received a reduced sentence of 6 years and 2 months with a minimum non-parole period of 3 years 6 months. Due to Howie's incarceration, the Comancheros had a vacancy to fill. It was Mark Buddle who eventually appointed himself as the Comancheros national president. In 2015, Howie was released on parole due to time already served. It was reported after being released from prison, Howie kept a low profile. He was also under strict parole conditions, which banned him from making contact with any member of the Zervas family. Howie was also banned from associating with outlaw motorcycle gang members or visiting any bikey operated premises. The other conditions included that Howie was never to possess a firearm nor use or possess prohibited drugs. However, despite this, Howie's underworld life soon caught up with him. On the 14th of February 2018, while sitting in his car which was parked at the Rockdale Fitness First Gym on the south side of Sydney, a masked gunman ran up to the window of his four-wheel drive and shot Howie multiple times in the head before returning to the getaway car and speeding off with an accomplice. The brutal murder was caught on a CCTV camera across the road from the gym. Howie was treated by paramedics at the scene and taken to hospital in critical condition, but died hours later. The police hunt for the masked killer began. Shortly after the shooting, the police found a burnt out Mercedes that had been used as a getaway car. There was also CCTV footage of two masked men running through a nearby street after the shooting. Six months into the investigation and the police arrested three men. Yusuf Nazli Oglu, who police accused of being the trigger man, Jamal El Jaidi, who was accused of being the getaway driver, and Ahmad Doha, who was accused of disposing of the getaway car. Doha pleaded guilty to being an accessory after the fact to Howie's murder and was sentenced to a non parole period of three years, four months in jail. Nazli Oglu and El Jahidi stood trial for murder before the Supreme Court jury in a case the Crown admitted was circumstantial and featured no direct evidence either man was responsible for Howie's murder. Howie's widow, Carolina Gonzalez, told the courts Nazli Oglu had once been a very close friend to her late husband. The friendship had soured during a fishing trip in New South Wales' central coast in the summer of 2016 when Howie called his wife and said the pair had fallen out. Howie had told his wife he was embarrassed by Nasli Oglu's behaviour and had ordered him to return to Sydney. Police alleged after murdering Howie, the men fleed the scene and then torched the Mercedes getaway car. They then escaped in a silver Toyota which was found a month later at Roseberry. 
The court heard Nazli Oglu and El Jahidi's genetic profiles were linked to DNA evidence found in the Toyota, where police also found gunshot residue on a balaclava. Both defendants denied during the month-long trial they were the men seen on the CCTV camera running away from the scene of Howie's murder. El Jahidi's defence also claimed he was too tall to be the getaway driver who was seen on the CCTV footage. El Jahidi measured at 199 centimetres tall, 6 foot 5. However, estimates of the men who were seen sprinting away after the first getaway car was set on fire put the tallest of the two men at 186.4 centimetres, 6 foot 1, with a 7 centimetre margin for error. After a week of deliberation, on the 9th of September 2020, the jury found Nazli Oglu and El Jahidi not guilty of murder. However, Nazli Oglu subsequently pleaded guilty to an unrelated charge of possession of a firearm and was jailed for three years. He was released from jail in September 2021. However, from that moment, his days were numbered. While in custody, Nazli Oglu was secretly recorded talking to another prisoner about his fate. He told the fellow prisoner, I used to hear people outside were going to knock me. On the 27th of June 2022, Nazli Oglu was shot multiple times in front of his partner in the car park of his apartment building. He later died in hospital. The brutal executions of Mick Howie and Yusuf Nazli Oglu shows just how volatile Sydney's underworld can be. Two lives lost and two men taken away from their loved ones. As always, if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Till next time, take care.